Well, that's a lot. That's a lot. But it really moves in sequence, doesn't it? Love, love for all, new life in the new Jerusalem. And we're, we're going to get there in a minute. But first of all, first of all uh, I want to share with you a couple of things that could, uh, should probably break your heart. They do mine. The first is a short video clip uh, from Rachel Held Evans, um, which we shared on Tuesday night at Gathering, uh, in which uh, she talks about, kind of talks about what breaks her heart. Um, and the other thing that's kind of heartbreaking about this is that she died a couple of weeks ago. She was 37. Uh, she died of an, uh, not really sure whether it was an infection or, or the, the coma that they put her into and the treatment that they did to try and address the infection. Um, but she was, is, uh, the voice of progressive women in the church. She grew up in the evangelical tradition and found her way over to uh, the progressive church. Uh, and so she has a lot to say about what the church says to people and how it says it. So this is Rachel Held Evans. That breaks my heart breaks my more heart. than anything more else than is anything people else suffering, people at, the suffering at the hands of Christians. Christians. Um, it breaks my heart to see the door of the kingdom slam in people's faces. faces. It breaks my heart, breaks my heart to, hear to hear stories about people who love Jesus, love Jesus, followed Jesus, followed and, then Jesus and then were told by, were told someone, by someone that their, that their sexuality, sexuality um, um, or whatever it may be, whatever it may be, made them less, made than. them less, than. <laughs> and, um, and that they um, had to that change, they had to change in a way they couldn't, in a way they change. couldn't change in order to, in order to be a follower of Jesus. Follower so, of Jesus. so it, it, what it, breaks it, my heart more than anything is just seeing people just turned away from the kingdom. Away from I, I just it I, makes I just, me angry. It makes me angry. Um, it hurts my heart. It hurts my heart. Um, um, but but I see Jesus. I see Jesus running after running after like like full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. And just because the church gives up on somebody doesn't mean that Christ has given up on somebody. And so I'm really hopeful, so I'm really hopeful that, that God, gets what God, God gets what God wants. And that that means, and that means all things all reconciled things reconcile to, God. to God. All things made all made things, made all made things made all resurrected. Things resurrected. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Um, um, I'm hopeful even I'm when hopeful I see even people, when I see hurt, people by the church, hurt by the church. Because, because you know, the church, you know, the church wounds, but wounds, the church can also church heal. Can also heal. Uh, and so I pray and, so I pray and, hope and, and hope long for and people long to find for churches, churches that are in the healing business, 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 not the wounding business. Wounding business. Um, when we're really doing the work really of Christ. Doing the work but Christ. even when they don't find that, I think Jesus think Jesus abandons the whole as the whole for the one feet. And I think Jesus will pursue and find people. Find people. This is a story from uh, earlier last week. I think it's actually uh, the end of the previous week, but uh, early last week. Tennessee pastor who repeatedly raped daughter 14 gets 12 years. Judge Stephen Sword sentenced pastor Richard to only 12 years in prison for repeatedly raping his 14-year-old daughter over the course of several years. In court, prosecutors argued the severity and heinous nature of the crimes deserved a minimum of 72 years in prison. That would have been the maximum sentence, by the way. Um, but the judge felt otherwise. I'm not going to read you all of the rest of this, because you don't want to read all of the rest of this. Um, but uh, over 30 par parishioners from the, his church came to court to show support for him. Uh, at sentencing, he refused to take responsibility for the crime and instead blamed the victim... Um, let me just cut to the chase here. He could have got 72 years in prison after being found guilty of repeatedly raping his 14-year-old daughter, but instead he received only 12 years because Judge Stephen Sword admired the good works of this, and I'm quoting, 
good Christian man, unquote. I'm confused. What does Christian mean anymore? I mean, we throw it around. Uh, like, how does it even apply in that context? I'm never really even sure. Um, but, but also, I don't, you probably saw this in the news too, that the uh, vice president uh, in the U.S., uh, Mike Pence, uh, spoke at the convocation of a Christian university at which he talked about how, um, essentially he talked about how Christianity is being persecuted. The people who are, are most demanding tolerance of others seem to be intolerant of Christians. Uh, so, first of all, let's be clear that I, I think he's a, being a little bit mistaken there, and he's mistaking disagreement and persecution. There are completely different things, because there are places in the world where people of any religious faith are, in fact, persecuted. And he does them a disservice by suggesting in any way that Christians in North America are persecuted. We have a lot of disagreements. And we should have a lot of disagreements because we're different. What we don't do is figure out how to address those disagreements in a, and I'm pretty sure I'm using this word correctly, Christian manner. The second thing about that is that, uh, and again, let's be absolutely clear about this, um, Jesus never asked for tolerance. Jesus only asked for love. And that applies across the board. So when it comes to people being intolerant of people who are intolerant because they're intolerant of the people who are intolerant being intolerant of them, maybe we could stop that for just a minute and love instead. Because I'd like to ask you to tell me a story of Jesus being intolerant. Even, even in disagreement, even in, even in addressing all of the things that Jesus challenged, it's not a question of intolerance. It's not a question of tolerance. It's a question of love instead of those things. So when Jesus had tried to address hate, it was with love. When Jesus tried to address, uh, when Jesus tried to address people who were poor and struggling and not being helped, it was with love when people tried to address uh, imbalances of power or in inequity amongst people, it was with love. Because it's about love. And maybe if we thought a little bit less about whether or not you should think what I think or we should be exactly the same, and instead replace that with love, maybe we'd have more effective dialogue about the things that we disagree over rather than immediately taking a defensive posture and suggesting that you're persecuting me because you don't agree with me. Right? We can disagree and have discussion about it. We can disagree and respect, respectfully acknowledge we're different. And then we can maybe not talk to each other or, and hear me out on this, once we've acknowledged we're different and we disagree, Maybe we could just keep working at that a little bit to try and find the common ground on which maybe we might be able to connect with each other. Because there's something there. There is. We're all children of the same God. We're all children of the same love. We're all children of the same earth. There is something there. So the other thing about that, though, that's really disconcerting to me is um, we use the word Christian to describe a lot of different things. And I think the key to that is that we use the word Christian to describe that very thing. See, Marcus Borg, had, I always thought, had an interesting way of saying this. Marcus Borg is a, uh, was a famous uh, theologian. Um, he died a few years ago. He wrote a lot of books. He famously wrote the books, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. 
I don't know if you're familiar with that book, or uh, reading the Bible again for the first time. He was part of the Jesus Seminary. He did a lot of work with Dominic Crossan. And, and he had a, he had an, a way of explaining this, that, that we, we are of a tradition that acknowledges both the Jesus of Nazareth and the Christ of the resurrection. Our problem sometimes is getting those two things to work together. And see, I think one of the reasons our problem for getting those two things to work together is, is based on the idea that we see the Christ as since resurrection. In other words, all of the traditions of the church. It's the church that defines Christian. Not Jesus. And see, the first, I know you've heard me say this so many times, but you might, and if you haven't, you might find this hard to believe, but the first followers of Jesus called themselves followers of Jesus or disciples of Jesus. When they got to be uh, enough that they thought they might have a name, they called themselves people of the way. Christians did not call themselves Christians. Somebody else did that. Someone else labeled Christians, who was a non-Christian, labeled them as Christians, and it stuck. So, are we followers of the traditions of the church and the culture of the church, or are we followers of Jesus? Let me just take a moment as you're pondering that to remind you that Jesus never said either or. He always said and. Because we can't be just one or the other, can we? We can't just be one or the other. You can't say, I am simply a follower of Jesus and not acknowledge the 2,000 years since that we have lived through the traditions of the church. You can't simply ignore that. You have to take that into consideration too. And if you are a foundational, the church is everything kind of person, sorry, you got to acknowledge Jesus. I know that sounds weird, because you'd think, hey, where did the church come from again? (laughs) But in fact, it's not hard to do that. And here's a a quick way to understand that. If if you belong to a church that, first of all, uh, almost exclusively reads from the epistles and rarely from the gospels, you should probably rethink where you are. Because you're not hearing the story of Jesus, you're hearing the story of Jesus as told by other people, reinterpreted by the person who's reading that to you. The epistles are valuable things. I've frequently talked about how important it is that we have those, particularly the ones that we know are for sure from Paul, because it's his writings to the people in churches that he's established to help them be more of who they are. But they are, in fact, Paul's understanding of Jesus' message. Even the Gospels themselves, whoever wrote them, the way they wrote them reflects what they're trying to tell of Jesus. But it's at least closer to the message. So that's step, thing number one. Thing number two is, if, if you belong to a church that uh, actively discriminates against people, hurts people, calls other people the enemy, you might want to think about the church that you belong to, because that isn't the message of Jesus either. How we create community isn't always just based on the message of love. Sometimes it's based on the message that gives us a feeling of empowerment, and sometimes that feeling of empowerment is about power over other people. And it feels good. It's not right, but it feels good. And we like it. But again, Jesus was never about power over people. Jesus was about power with people. Jesus was about empowering people to be more of who they are. And who you are, who you are, is created in the image of God. You are literally love. 
in human form. Which, by the way, describes Jesus. It is one of the ways that we describe Jesus, right? Do you remember uh, um, Christina Rossetti's famous Christmas poem? It's sometimes sung as a, as a hymn at Christmas. Um, Love came down at Christmas. The way John, in the Gospel of John, the way John describes Jesus is the Word made flesh. Love come alive. God among us. Emmanuel means God among us. That's you, too. It seems pretty clear to me, particularly if you, say, read the Gospel of John, where it says, love one another as I have loved you. But it's not just about John. Remember, that's the later Gospel. The other stories of Jesus that we know. Think about all of those stories of Jesus that we know. Yes, there's a lot of Jesus stories where he talks, and he talks, and he talks. But think about all of what he did, how he lived, because there's the key right there. Jesus lived into his being, which is love. He lived love with people. Did that mean he was always perfectly calm and understanding and never got annoyed about anything, never got upset about anything, he never cried, probably never laughed either? No. No, it doesn't mean that. It means Jesus faced challenges too, just like you. I can't imagine that there wasn't a few mornings that Jesus woke up thinking, oh, crap, it's a day. Just like we do. I can't imagine that there weren't a few days where at the end of the day, Jesus was like, ah, it was not a good day. I'm sure there were a few days that were, that was a good day too, just like the rest of us. So the stories of the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, not just John's interpretation of them, but the stories of Jesus are about Jesus living what he tells people. To love. To care for others. To show grace. To have understanding. To engage people. That's what living love means, to engage people. Don't stop at, you don't like beets, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Don't stop at, ooh, you like beets, I don't want anything to do with you. Don't stop at, you look different than me, or you look scary. I'm trying not to look at anyone as I say that. (laughs) But but don't think, don't, don't think of those things as limiting your engagement of other people. It's so easy to do that. It absolutely is. I'm not saying it's not hard to try and get past those things. I'm not saying ignore them either, by the way. Get past them to the person. Because that per- the person, I absolutely 100% can assure you, has something in common with you. You are both love, whether you can see it or not. You are both love. We all are. Sometimes we bury it really deep and we express ourselves in a manner which leads everyone around us to think, no, we are not. But yes, yes, we are in our heart of hearts. And that's the thing about Jesus is that he tried to engage people in a way that brought out what's at the heart of their heart. So when he says to the disciples and to you and me, Love one another the way I have loved you. He means, look, I showed you. I showed you how to do it. I didn't just tell you. There's no manual. I showed you. Go and do that. I know, I know, I, I'm not the only one either, by the way, who repeatedly, repeatedly hammers away at this, love one another as I showed you to love, because Jesus showed you to love. That's the whole point of telling stories of Jesus, is he showed you to love. Except sometimes we're really quick to stop there, because otherwise we might have to engage the practical part of explaining that, which is how do you do that? Because it can be really hard when it's somebody who is fighting you 
every step of the way and trying to make it hard for you to love them. It can be difficult when it's fearful. Jesus' most favorite words ever? Don't be afraid. Jesus said don't be afraid more than he said love each other. Because there's lots to be afraid of. But if just for a minute you can put aside the fear, if just for a minute you can put aside the, the, the thinking that the other person is so different or that somehow this is not going to work or it's too much trouble and engage each other, we can find a way. Because Jesus didn't say, love one another the way I showed you to love, that's it. Then he said, this is how people will know you are followers of mine if you do this. If you love one another the way I showed you, it's how people will know you are a follower of Jesus. So let's talk about being Christian again for a minute. Being Christian has to reflect that. It has to reflect that. If being a follower follower of Christ, being a follower of Jesus, being a follower of Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, however you want to say that. I probably said that a little bit too emphatically just then. But however you want to say that, being Christian needs to reflect that we are followers of a way of love. If you are hurting someone, you are not being Christian. If you are discriminating against someone, you are not being Christian. Maybe maybe the best you could say is you're reflecting the manner in which Christianity has tended to behave historically, for 2,000 years. But even then, you can't really say that either. Because, and here's, of course, the always problem with labels. The always problem with labels is we apply them to everyone. And they don't apply to everyone. For every story that you might read about that, like that pastor from Tennessee that are horrifying and heartbreaking, There are a thousand stories we will not hear of someone being Jesus to someone else. Of someone loving and caring. Of someone bringing healing instead of hurt. If we as a community can always err on the side of love, we will be a healing community. If we as a community can always err on the side of being a follower of Jesus more than the traditions of the church or the history of the church, particularly if they're ones that discriminate against people or hurt people, then we're bringing love and healing. Rachel's right when she says because she's experienced it too, right? She's experienced a church as a community excluding people and hurting them. And she's right. Jesus is going to chase after those people still. Somehow. It could be in another community. It could be in another person. It could be simply in spirit. But being a follower, a follower of Jesus means bringing that love. Living that love. Sharing that love with other people. It's hard work. So Peter has a vision about all the stuff he's been told to exclude in his life. And he has a vision of God saying, don't, no, listen, if if I created everything in love then you should love everything. And he realizes it isn't about food. It isn't about stuff. It isn't about things. It's about you and me. 
And if you can just wade through all the convoluted language of that passage in Acts, it's Peter coming to the realization, Peter, who, by the way, initially opposed preaching to Gentiles, coming to the realization that the message of Jesus is for everyone, whether they receive it or not, whether they look like they're doing what you think they should or not, the message is still for them. Whether they look like you and me or not, the message is still for them. I am doing a new thing, says God. How long are we waiting for that new thing? Because I think we read that, story, that passage from Revelation, and by the way, it's not the only place in the Bible where God says, I am doing a new thing. Jeremiah, for example. And we wait for God to do a new thing. And we will probably keep waiting until we realize that just like love, it's a two-way street. God needs our participation. That new thing is you. It's in you. You are the seed, if you like, of the new thing. How are we going to make it grow? That's why we gather in communities, is to make it grow. That's why we gather in communities, I hope, that invite and welcome everyone that share love with everyone, that create a place where people feel safe to be who they are, where people feel like they can belong because belonging isn't just about I fit in or I look the same or I like what you like. It's about feeling like what you bring that's unique about you becomes part of the community and is shared by others too. That's when you really feel like you belong. And, and we can only do that with the kind of engagement that comes from being a follower of Jesus and living into that love. Does it mean, by the way, that any communities that are not followers of Jesus, i.e. other religious traditions, um, can't do that? No, of course not. Because what is Jesus, after all? Jesus is love. The word made flesh, love come among us. The, the realization of what's in all of us. You can be Jesus too, to everyone around you. And everyone you meet can be Jesus to you. That's the seed is planted. We need to grow that.